Welcome to Teaching Artist Podcast, a show dedicated to discussions of teaching art to kids, making art, and how those things overlap and feed each other. I'm Rebecca Potts, your host, a visual arts teaching artist. Anderson has been teaching for 18 years, but had a 15-year career in advertising before going into teaching. It was so helpful for me to talk with her about the difficult decision to leave her first career in order to devote herself to motherhood, and then her path towards teaching. This conversation was recorded the week that George Floyd was murdered, and I awkwardly asked Melanie about addressing racism as a white teacher. It's something that has been part of my teaching practice for years, but I'm still, and I feel like I will always be, figuring out how to do anti-racism and anti-bias work as a teacher and now as a podcaster. So I really appreciated Melanie's willingness to share her thoughts and how she sees her role as amplifying student voices. Melanie Anderson earned her BFA in graphic design from the University of Memphis and her Master's of Art Education from Memphis College of Art. She began her career as a graphic designer and served as the Director of Advertising for Catherine Stores Corporation for 15 years before becoming an art educator. She is a working artist, high school art teacher, and dog advocate living in Arlington, Tennessee, a suburb of Memphis. She was recently named the West Tennessee Art Educator of the Year, and she serves on the board of the Tennessee Art Education Association. Melanie is most recognized for her large-scale paintings of colorful, happy dogs. Her personal artwork was featured in 2014 and 2016 in the Insight Mixed Media series published by North Light Books, and was featured in August 2020 in a special edition of Acrylic Works from Artists Magazine. Her work and teaching practices are featured in the college textbook Teaching and Learning in Art Education by Deborah Sickler Voigt. Melanie is in the process of writing a book entitled You Can Be a Maker, How to Find the Time and Space to Create. Her work can be found in personal art collections around the country. This episode did have some audio issues, but it is definitely still listenable and totally worth it. So let's get into it. Hello. So I am speaking with Melanie Anderson, and I'm so excited to hear about your teaching career and art career and kind of everything around them. Hello. Hi. So I like to start with just some background. And could you kind of share your story? Like, how did you become an artist and a teacher? And which one came first? Okay. Gosh, I came to teaching and being an artist in a very roundabout kind of way. It wasn't ever anything on my radar or it wasn't something I thought I would do, but here I am. So let's see, you know, I was always that arty kid. I made art when I was little and I was, I was a Girl Scout. And so I was exposed to a whole lot of different kind of art making things and earned a lot of badges and did a lot of arts and crafts when I was a kid, which was great. And it kind of made me fearless as like, you know, not being afraid to try different things. And so that was, you know, I was, I was definitely that artsy kid. And in high school, I was always that kid that was the, the person that was the go-to person for bulletin boards or door decorations or if the football team needed a run through sign I was that person so I was I'm graduated in 1981 which makes me kind of tail end baby boomer and we didn't have art classes the way that they were not at all like they are now you know like I had one art teacher and really just one class to take so I took the class in high school and loved it but you know that was it it wasn't like you know now we have three-year art and you know then some but yeah it, it wasn't like it is now so art was just kind of part of what I did it wasn't really who I was I mean I was involved with, with a lot of things besides art I I was a high school athlete and a cheerleader and I danced and so you know, art was a thing I did, but it didn't define me. 
yeah, so I I didn't plan to be an artist. I didn't plan to be a teacher. Teaching wasn't on my radar. But when I went into college, I didn't really know what I wanted to study. And first, I thought I wanted to be in fashion merchandising. I uh, I was inspired by my grandmother, who was an amazing seamstress, and she made like everything my sister and I wore when we were little and and in high school. And the stuff did not look homemade. It looked it looked really beautiful. Like it fit like a glove. She was just amazing. And so I thought fashion merchandising, I was always interested in fashion. And I took a semester of that. And I was like, no, 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 this is not for me. Then next I thought, well, maybe architecture. And so I took a drafting class that was awful. Oh my gosh, I was so bad at that. So anyway, I ended up with graphic design as a major and I did get my BFA in graphic design, which was wonderful because I got to take all those great studio classes. Yeah. It, it was great and got out of school. Let's see. I I graduated from college and got married all in the same week and oh, wow. uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was Busy it was week. A, busy week and I I was at the time a bartender and I left my bartending job and got a job as a paste-up artist which when I was first out of school this was before you know PCs it really makes me sound old but um <laughs> when we, we paste-up artists we, everything was done by hand and so yeah. I I did that and I was a typesetter and a proofreader and kind of worked my way up in this first job and ended up being the regional print coordinator or print manager, I should say. And I learned the printing business. And so that kind of started me out in, in as far as advertising goes. And then I got a really great job with Catherine Stores Corporation and got to combine my love of fashion and graphic design and went there and worked my way up to being the advertising director there. And I worked in that business for a very long time. And that was an amazing job in a very formative time for me. I was in my early early to late 20s and into my 30s. And I uh, got to be around so many creative, amazing people. I traveled extensively and I learned a lot about myself. And I learned, you know, I, I think that's when I kind of developed my aesthetic awareness but I wasn't making a lot of art during that time. I was doing like wearable art and jewelry and stuff like that. So I did that for, for many, many years. And then my husband and I decided that we wanted to start our, start our family and had my son. I was 33 years old and was really deep into this job and this career that I loved. And it was tough. I'm not going to lie. It was tough to to do that. My husband had a home business. Home. He's always worked out of his home. He's in, in the entertainment industry. And so I would leave for like 10 days at a time. And, you know, a couple, like every other month I would be out of town and my poor husband would be at home with an infant. And my son was very <sighs> colicky. And Ugh. yeah, and it, it was, it was a tough time and it was really it took a toll on both of us and, you know, yeah, I had to make a change. And so I, it was a hard decision because I really had worked hard for that job. And I was really kind of, that was my identity kind of, I feel like revolved around that position. So anyway, I left that job to be a stay at home mom. I did consult with that same company for a couple of years and staying at home, was a really great thing because, you know, as, as a mom, y you want to be there for your, your child. You, you don't get a do-over as a mommy. And I wanted to make sure that I didn't mess that job because I think that was the most important job, you know, definitely is being a mom. And so I stayed at home with him, but I knew that I wanted to go back to work at some point, but I didn't think advertising was going to be the thing for me to go back to. And my mom said, hey, Melanie, you know, have you ever thought of being an art teacher? And I was like, oh, no, 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 I, I couldn't be a teacher. You know, my sister was a teacher and I was like, no, that's that's just not for me. But I got to thinking about it. I had been a brownie leader before my son was born just because I thought it would be fun and I wanted to have some way to give back. And the children, the, the little girls, you know, they related to me pretty well and I really enjoyed working with them. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe teaching. Okay. So I, I sought out the programs around, you know, the universities around me and nobody offered uh, a master's in art education. So, but I did find out that I could go get my teaching license. So 
That's what I did. I went back to school for two years, got my teaching license, and landed my first job as a middle school teacher, of all things. Mm -hmm. So I that's that's kind of how I got into teaching. And later I went back to get my master's in art education. But anyway, that's how I got to this. And now I teach high school and I've been see, I just finished my eighteenth year of teaching. So Wow. Yeah. Uh I love that. And I feel like I can relate to a lot of that story. Yeah, I had my daughter at 34 and I was already kind of at home because we had moved abroad and I had very little work and no work visa. Oh, wow. But before that, my identity was really wrapped up in like being an artist and teaching art, right. which I just totally abandoned because motherhood overtook right, me. Right, right. Yeah. So I, I completely relate to that feeling of like, ah, I want this identity, but I also, you know, want to prioritize being a mom and right. let it over overtake you for a little bit. Yes. And I, you know, would not take anything for those years I got to spend with my son, you know, just being home with him. That was just, it was absolutely the right thing to do for me. And yeah. I'm sure it was for you too. And, 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 you know, I just have never looked back and it, it was a hard decision to make, but the best thing I ever did for, for me, my family, my son for, you know, it was, it was great. Yeah. And then how was it going back to school and kind of diving into a new career after, you know, having like already having a career that you really loved and enjoyed? It was really different. I will tell you in the time that I was in school the first time. And then as I like, came back as an older person, you know, I was always and you know, when you're, when you're young and you go to school, it's, it's, there's so much going on and it's new and you know, you're, I was very social and, you know, I made good grades, but I could have done better. But yeah, when you go back as an older person, you know, you're more invested in, you know, I was the curve buster and, you know, was always the one that would make my deadline if I have to stay up all night to get this project finished, you know, it was a real different kind of thing going back the second time. And like I say, much more invested and the grades were a lot better going back. So, but it was, <laughs> yeah, and it was fun. And I love school. I love school and I love art school, especially. So I just... Mm -hmm ate it up, you know, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. And were you, was your son still relatively young at that point? Was it tricky kind of juggling yes. being a mom and it, yeah, it, how did you manage that? It was very <laughs> tricky. Um, yeah, he was, let's see, I guess I went back to school when he was three does that sound right? He was three or four. So yeah, I would uh, I would drop him off at Mother's Day out and go do my classes, come back, you know, do homework and stuff whenever, you know, he was napping or yeah, definitely had to juggle all of that. And, you know, taking some studio classes. And during that time too, you had to figure out, you know, when, when to make the art and mm -hmm. write the papers. And so yeah, that was a, that was a tricky time, but it was, it was good. It was really good. Yeah. 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 And did, did you kind of start your, because now you're painting these really colorful, beautiful paintings. Did you kind of start that style when you went back to school or was that later? It was later. When I went back to school, I started doing a lot of portrait paintings and I was working a lot in watercolor mm -hmm. in school. And I did a whole series of paintings of my son and his friends. In fact, my first, first solo show was called Making Faces. And it was, I had done a lot of photography of my son and all his little friends and you know part of the fun thing that we did with them was you know I'd always say hey give me your silliest face and we'll do all these pictures and so I turned that into a painting series and then you know I had had that show and then I dabbled in you know like some paintings of these very fashiony looking girls and then I did some abstract stuff I, I was all over the board for a while and then Somewhere along the line, I did a painting. I did a great big painting of my little bitty poodle. <laughs> it was really a lot of fun, and uh, I enjoyed it so much. I was like, you know, I want to incorporate this into a lesson into my classroom. I was teaching high school by then, and I did, and it was so much fun. I kept painting dogs, and people saw them, and they liked them, and people started asking me to paint their dogs. And then at one point, I said, oh, I'm going to every breed of dog there is. And so I started, you know, going through the breeds and uh, I've still not painted every breed there is yet, but I've painted a lot now, but it, it kind of caught on and people started commissioning me to do portraits for them for their dogs. Some, some for their 
children, but not more for their dogs than their children, which I always found interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and do you feel like your teaching kind of informs your art making at all or vice versa? Does your art making come into your teaching? I think they go hand in hand. I think both. I think definitely my teaching informs my art and my art informs my teaching. I know that if if I'm doing something, say I've learned a new trick or technique or way of doing something and it's fun for me, I definitely go back and come up with a lesson. It's because I think if it's fun for me, my students will think it's a lot of fun too. So I'll make up a lesson to make sure they get to try this thing or this medium or whatever. And there are times when we're doing things in class and I get real excited about it. And then that might kind of show up in my artwork or maybe a student does something that I'm like, oh, wow, that's, that's amazing. And, you know, it might inspire something, a direction I might go in my art. And I'm always taking like, workshops and going to conferences and, you know, getting ideas for my classroom. And I know a couple of years ago, well, actually it was about six years ago, I, I went to this one conference and this one workshop completely changed the direction of my own personal art. So yes, I think all of it, all, it just kind of all goes hand in hand for me. Yeah. And what was that workshop that changed the direction? Could you talk more about that? Yes, I can. It was a workshop. The teacher instructor's name was Nicole Briscoe, and she is a high school teacher and it was a mixed media class and it was amazing. And it's, really got me thinking about how to incorporate a, a lot more mixed media. I'd just been really just putting on canvas at that point. And so, yeah, it, it completely changed the way I looked at things and thought about things. And even you know, definitely the way I taught mixed media, because that was something I had always struggled with, with, with students is incorporating mixed media. And so that helped me a lot. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing when something like that can just click like yeah. that for you. Yeah. It was great. You know, in your own work and the classroom. Yes. Uh, and I know you mentioned that you started out in middle school, but you prefer high school? Yes. Middle school was great. I mean, you know, I, I was just felt so fortunate to get a job right out of college, you know, right. and middle school was available and it was great. It was, I, I learned a lot. The school that I got hired to, to teach in was, it was a brand new school. So it, I got to start the art program and I was the only art teacher there, which is good and bad, mm -hmm. but it was definitely a learning experience Middle schoolers are a special, a special group yeah. and hats to anybody that is a career middle school teacher. I, I know, I know what you do and you're, <laughs> you are special, but high school is where I ultimately wanted to end up teaching and that's, it's great. I love high school. Yeah. Yeah. And do you have any kind of tips that you would give a new teacher coming into it? Yeah. You know, I for a new teacher, my best tip for you would be organization is key to everything when it comes to teaching art. You have to have your supplies organized, your room organized. You have to teach your kids organization. You have to teach them procedure for getting things out and cleaning things up. You have to teach them how to take care of supplies. You have to make sure they know where everything is stored. Like my room's, you know, labeled with everything where everything's stored. But And I think that's across the board for elementary to high school. You have got to be organized. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're organized, your classroom management will definitely take care of itself. And I think too, for new teachers, I would definitely suggest make sure you have more work than you think you would need for students, especially for the early <laughs> finishers, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah. Just always have something to kind of slip in there, you know, when, when they get done. Yes. Yes, absolutely. To both of those yeah. organization and yeah, having like backups and backups. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, and what would you say is your teaching style? You know, I'm a real hands-on teacher like I'm real demonstration heavy I, I demonstrate everything I want to I want students to know how to use the materials I want to share techniques I want to help them know how to create certain effects with the materials and so I guess with my underclassmen I do it's very technique heavy and demonstration heavy and then when I'm working with the seniors and the, the upper level classes we're more it's more critical thinking and problem solving and conceptual and 
yeah, more, I guess more definitely conceptual choice based. I do a lot of prompt, mm-hmm. prompt driven lessons and that type of thing. Yeah. And how have you kind of managed the switch to online teaching? Ooh, not real <laughs> well, honestly. It was, I, I tell you, I have a habit of videotaping all of my demonstrations just so that I have them. And it's it's always been a great backup for if a student is absent, then, you know, I can tell them to go t- into the video and that type of thing. So that type of thing is easy. What is not easy is finding something when students are at home and they don't have materials. Yeah. And so I had the task of, you know, coming up with something that students could do at home with with not a lot of resources. And so I ended up coming up with a lot of different prompts for sketchbooks that they could use whatever materials they had at hand. That was for my underclassmen. But the challenge was I I teach AP art and the challenge was, Mm -hmm. you know, we lost a whole nine weeks and it was the time when we were going to be putting together our portfolios and the AP curriculum completely changed this year and they added a whole writing component. And so that was, that was the semester that we were going to, or the nine weeks where we were going to get all of that together. And then we had to come up with a way of presenting it this year rather than just presenting a finished piece of art. College board asked for, they wanted to see process. They wanted you to write about process. So Rather than just upload a JPEG, we had to upload slides that showed process and had writing in them and had finished product. And we had not even figured out what platform we were going to create the slides on yet, you know, when we were suddenly shut down. And so trying to manage that virtually was difficult. I mean, Zoom conferencing was great once we finally were able to get everything to work. And uh, I spent a lot of time on the phone with my AP students, you know, one-on-one. I, there was one day I, I was on the phone for five hours with, with all my students, just, you know, trying to help them one-on-one. Wow. And the thing was critiquing artwork online, like by email. Yeah. Was something that you could have a five-minute face-to-face and under and know that they understood what you were saying would then take me 45 minutes to type up and still I was not sure they were clear on what I was trying to say. And then, you know, you email stuff and and then you might get ghosted for two weeks, you know, and it was, it was tough. I'm not going to lie. It was just, it was a challenge. And I really, really hope we get back in the classroom next year for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And do you know what it's looking like? Is that likely or some sort of hybrid model no idea at this point i just yeah, nobody's I think we're yeah, <laughs> nobody's saying yeah. so, fingers crossed, oh. you know yeah yeah what sort of resources were most helpful were you using like google classroom no we use schoology and so okay. that's where all of our students have ipads and so schoology is we, we would send out a lot of information on schoology and then like i said the zoom conferencing was really great for mm-hmm. ap because i was able to you know see them all face to face we were able to talk and you know i, I think me talking to them face to face is a lot easier, like say, than, than trying to send emails out. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Crazy. Wow. Yeah. And through all of this, have you managed to keep up your sort of studio practice as an artist? Yes. In fact, I mean, this quarantine is great for my studio practice. <laughs> Yeah, Yeah. more time than I've ever had probably in my life. And I've been able to, you know, work on my commission work, but definitely explore a lot of things that I don't get to do normally. And that's been amazing. So yeah, I've definitely kept that up and started a couple of new projects on top of that. So yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And do you have a studio outside of your home at all? Or is it normal that it's like just at home? I have a, a studio at home. It's I, I've got a dedicated okay. space. Actually, I have two spaces. I've got one that I will do my painting and then I've got one upstairs where I, I oh. make jewelry also. But that's a jewelry studio and kind of a storage space as well. But my studio downstairs is the one that I'm always in and it's, it's a great space and I just, I love yeah. my studio. Studio. So I've, I feel blessed to have a dedicated space because I didn't used to have a dedicated space, you know. And so it's it really makes a difference when you can just leave everything out and, you know, working on the kitchen table. But if you've got to work on the kitchen table, you work on the kitchen table. Yeah, That's what I used to do. yeah if you do so, kind of do what you have great. to do. 
You do. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, it's interesting because I talked to some artists who have like before all of this, they felt so, you know, like excited that they had dedicated themselves to having an outside studio that's like this extra thing that's, you know, I'm paying for the studio space to really be a professional artist. But now it's like, it's not at home, right? You know, maybe it's closed, or it's harder to get to, or it's, you know, not as safe. Right, right. So, yeah, I'm glad mine is here. Yeah. And could you maybe describe your work for someone who hasn't seen it? Yes. It's always a tricky thing. Yeah. So I put these really large, colorful, expensive dogs for the most part. I I put some cats, but it's mainly dogs. And they, I, I call them happy dogs. I like it when my art can make someone else smile, and mm-hmm. you know, I like to share my love of my dogs. And if somebody else loves more dogs, I'd like to share that joy that I get from just being you know, around these amazing creatures. Yeah. Oh, nice. Do you have any really big sort of influences within your artwork? Are there any artists that you just love, or is there something else that influences it? I know. The happy dogs. The happy dogs, yeah. yeah. Well, I have two dogs that I live with, Lizzie and Penny. So, I mean, they're big influences on my work. Like, when I do my work, it's a lot of things like dogs do. Like, if they're laying on their back and they want to be up, or, you know, it's just, I've got a lot of things that I've done, like, say, just silly things that they do. You know, I've got one, I've got one in my bathroom with uh, my dogs pooping, which, you know, okay, that's crazy, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's what dogs do, you know? So dogs are big influences. As far as artists go, I love good artists. There's so many amazing artists that, you know, I love their work. And just, there's so many great artists on Instagram. I follow so many artists, and every day I'm just so inspired by, you know, you just open up Instagram and boom, there you go. You just, inspiration is everywhere. Mm-hmm. Good, good artists historically would be John Singer Sargent for sure. And I love Matisse's book, my favorite artists. And I love the colors just because the use of color is so amazing. And I love color so much. But those are my main influences. And then I've got I've got friends that are artists that really inspire me. My students inspire me. I just think inspiration is everywhere, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I know you, you know, you do a lot of commissions. You also have, you work with a gallery. Yes. Is that right? Yes. There's a gallery in town, T. Clifton Gallery. I work with them on placing artwork in St. Jude Hospital mm-hmm. and just some local businesses and things. I work with them. And then there is a, a shop. Um, we have this amazing arts district called the Broad Avenue Art District. And I've got going to shop there called Tim and Brad. And so I'm just, I'm really, I feel really happy that I get to share my work in that way as well. Yeah. And would you be able to talk more about how you kind of seek out those opportunities or how that you know, for an artist that's more emerging, like how to begin those relationships. You know, I think I think it all starts with telling people that you're an artist. Yeah. And I, it's really hard for me to do in the beginning, like to own that, you know? Yeah. So I think you've got to own that you're an artist. Let people know, you know, if you are creating art right now, social media, I mean, we just have such a great tool at our disposal that wasn't around when I first started. So if it wasn't as easy then, though. Now you can just put whatever you're doing, you can put your process, and people are really interested in what artists are doing. And, you know, I think it's so much easier now. But I think networking is, is so important. You know, you network with your artist friends, network. You know, I, I started on Broad Avenue and just just, you know, talking about what's in their shop, a lot of them are artists, and then one thing leads to another, and, you know, then you end up working with people, and, yeah, I just think networking's huge, and then social media is fantastic, and, you know, seek out shows with a cop artist, yeah, what have you got to lose, you know, just just to cover everything. There's a lot of contests, things that are sponsored by things like Artist Magazine and North White Books, mm-hmm. and there's all that type of thing you can apply for. And, yeah. you know, like I say, you don't have anything to lose. Just send your work in, apply for everything. Yes. Oh, I love that philosophy. Just apply yeah. for it. And, like, you know, I hear so much this sort of fear of rejection. Yeah. But I keep telling others and also trying to tell myself, you know, yeah. you can't 
succeed, like you can't get an acceptance if you don't apply. It's true. It's going to be 100% rejection if you never apply. So true. So true. <laughs> yeah. And you, know, and you know, it's so subjective. You, you just can't say like, you're not getting what you want right away. It just, you know, one day it'll happen. There's a residency that I have applied for probably for six years in a row. And so I'm still fine, you know, it's, it's okay. You know, they only take like, in the whole nation so hey okay one day uh, we'll see <laughs> you know yeah just keep putting it out there absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah and then there's also this idea that you're applying and there's the curators are seeing your work and they might you know there's so many things that goes into every right. every call that it's like your work might not fit this show or this opportunity but the curator sees it and says hmm I'm gonna put that in like my database or the back of my head for the next one that that this is suitable for yes yes I think the more you can put yourself out there the more opportunities you'll have definitely Uh, have there been any really good resources that have kind of helped you along the way with with the art career I would just say social media more than anything I I think that Facebook is where the the majority of my clients come from. I mean, really, Facebook, well, I've got followers on Instagram. Uh-huh. It's a different group of, of followers. Like, my Instagram is totally different than my Facebook followers. So, I think Facebook is my biggest source of commissions, for sure. And I've done some festivals, definitely done some festivals in the beginning that kind of got me out there. And that's really, that's really, festivals are tough, especially when you work full time. But there's one that we have every year in my area, it's the Cooper Young Festival. And it attracts a lot of people and a lot of art buyers and really kind of helped me get out in the beginning and get my name out there and kind of gave me a little bit of recognition locally. Mm-hmm. So that was a good thing to do. Yeah. And how was that, like the first time you did it? Because I know that can, there can be a lot of sort of setup and prep for those. It was a lot of work because I, I had to figure out how to set it all up. You know, at a festival mm-hmm. like that, it's a lot of low grab and go things. And so, you know, there's some artists there that mm-hmm. will sell your more pricey works of art, but um, I had a ton of prints mounted on canvas and I had to figure out a way to hang them all. And I had my tent and the setup. You know, it's like a 5.30 a.m. set up. Yeah. They were my, my, my family that puts up with me. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We got there, got it set up. Had it, my, the first time I did it was fantastic. I, I actually did it with my friend, and we had a great day and sold a lot of artwork. And the next year, I had a group of myself and, you know, another successful festival. And then I had a call, you know, got my car that you know, wanted custom commissions after that. So... Festivals are hard. I the ones that I usually just go on festivals, three three day festivals. That's that's tough. I don't think that's for me. But maybe if I did it full time, and that's my deal. Maybe maybe it would be different. But as a teacher, one day is is good. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I've never done one. It seems like a lot of work. It is. It is. Thinking of time management, how do you, I guess, in a normal sort of teaching week, how do you kind of fit in teaching and art making and, you know, everything else? I think with everything in life, you make time to do things that are important to you. And art is definitely very high on that list. I have a studio space in my classroom. And so I've got projects always going at school. I've got projects going at home. And, you know, I've always got sketchbooks and things and I try to make time to make art every day if I can of my own but you know realistically just that's not always going to happen but in some days I'm just I'm tired but I do try to make art and I, I usually have a reading list of commissions so that definitely motivates me to come home and do the work but I will a lot of times start something at school if my students have if I've given all the instruction for a lesson and I've helped everybody and they're in production mode, then I may scoot on over to the easel and do a little bit of work. And I think that's, I like doing that because I, I want my students to see that I think this is reach. And I think they always get a kick out of seeing what I'm working on personally. And I, I think that's important. I think it's important that your students see that you can make art because, you know, they, they want to know, can you draw? You know, that type of thing. Right. 
Right. So I try to make sure I'm doing a lot of that with students. And then at home, like I say, I've got my set up at home. And I try to walk the dogs. And usually I have a stationary bike. And I usually ride my stationary bike for about an hour every day. And I check my emails while I'm doing that. And then, you know, I cook dinner, clean it up. Then I go into the studio and I do my studio work. So it's a lot into a day, but it's, yeah. it's very fulfilling. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of the same. I kind of squeeze in the art making in the evening after, after the kid is asleep and right. kind of finish dinner and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. You, you got to work it in when you can. Yeah. And, and, you know, when my son was, when my son was little, but it was a lot harder mm-hmm. because I, he, he played sports and I was the, you know, the soccer team manager and all that. But, like, I would take my sketchbook with me or, you know, there's always something that I would carry with me while I'm waiting on him at this or whatever. So, you know, there's ways to work it in, you know. Yeah. I'm an empty nester now, so I have a lot more time than I've, you know, had in the past. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting too how like we have these sort of seasons in our lives and the art making goes up and down as does everything else and you know sometimes you have more time for it or you have less time for it and that's right just kind of have to keep keep the faith that it'll it'll come back that's right for sure and it, yeah. yes and you will have more time in your life at some point and and i didn't ever think i'd have this time to work well, yeah this is different and great for, for that reason yeah i'm i mean i i feel like probably all parents with young children are in the same boat as me where i'm like i have somehow less time now that is true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure yeah but i have you know holding on to that hope that like things will change again they always keep shifting and right yeah right yeah I haven't really asked this question before, but I've really been puzzling how how to address racism as a white teacher yes. in my classroom. Yes. And I'm not sure how to do it, but I thought maybe I would ask, do you, have you been thinking about this? And like, what, I have. what do you kind of already do, I'm sure? Uh, and what do you think you might change? Yeah. So, uh, yes, that's, that's a different. Throwing the hard questions. Yeah, the hard questions. It's okay. Here's the thing. As an AP studio art teacher, or as any kind of art teacher, I think it's our job to help our students find their artistic voice. Mm-hmm. And that is one of my biggest, biggest challenges and pushes as an AP arts teacher. And I think that art right now, more than ever, is so needed mm-hmm. for process going on and people express what's going on and how they feel about it and I think that is our job and our teachers to facilitate that and make sure our, mm-hmm. our students have a way to express what they're feeling and like I said we need to be facilitators of all of this and we need to be showing artwork that addresses what's going on and I know that my AP students mm-hmm. I had a student last year who was about stereotypes and it was a very powerful body of work and really opened up a lot of conversations in our school and very meaningful conversations and she was her artwork she was making these beautiful gorgeous but they had heard about the head the question mark and the first one she did was ghetto with a question mark and then she her second one was felon with a question mark and she classmates and like I said it was all story and she had up on a list of stereotypes that she wanted to address and it really gave some discussed with and disturbed her body of work but that was the whole thing is you know we wanted to create a little discomfort. Mm-hmm. So I think those are the kinds of things we've got to do we've got to encourage our students to address the hard issues mm-hmm. and to use the energy as and we just have to figure out how to use it and I think as art teachers we need to help with that. Yeah, absolutely. And I've seen through this entire time with students learning at home from a distance, I keep hearing over and over just 
how much it's helping them process emotions around that and trauma and just hoping that art can continue helping them sort of process. But also I love the idea of that our job is to help give them that voice and help them figure out how to share their voice. Yes, and you know, I just think we can use our art for healing. I think now more than ever, the arts are needed for healing and, and like I said, expressing your heart and your feelings. And so I think we just it, I think it is very valuable right now, especially. Yeah. And it's, I keep thinking about how this is, we're going through these sort of historic times and looking back in 20 years, like what's my, what are my students going to remember and what's my daughter going to remember and hopefully some of the art that's kind of lifted them through this will stick in their brains. Yes, yes, hopefully. Yeah, it's it's definitely trying times right now and I, you know, I just hope maybe art can help them process some of this for sure yeah is there anything else that you would want to share about your sort of your teaching or your art making and then I have a couple of just sort of fun get to know you questions let's see so it was quarantine time I have had a chance to well I started writing a book last year and it is about the name of it is you can be a maker how to find the time and space to create so I I started a couple years ago, I had a lot of people asking me, art teachers specifically, like, Melanie, you know, how do you find time to make art, you know, after you've taught all day, all day and, you know, you're a mom and a wife and all that, and I started thinking about, you know, what is it that I do, and I started writing things down, and I ended up just a pretty big list of all my little tips and tricks for how I work art into my daily life. And so I wrote this book about it, and I had it pretty well ready to go, and just recently I was on a long bike ride and got to think about things, and I decided I wanted to add some contributors. And so I've reached out to a lot of artist friends and that I respect their work and have asked them to also give me their tips and tricks and you know, show me their space and their product and all that type of thing. And so I'm going to add that into my little book, but I hope that I can have my book ready hopefully in 2021. So something I've been doing that I'm pretty excited about. Yeah. yeah, so I can't wait to get that all back up. Yeah, that's amazing. You'll have to let me know when it comes out. That's awesome. Okay, I will, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I want to read it and then share it. Okay, sounds yeah. good. Yay. And yeah, is there anything you're kind of curious about right now? I am curious so many things. Artistically, I am been looking at a lot of better ideas. I want to learn how to be like moving through speaking tutorials and that type of thing. So I've been working on that mm-hmm. and pissing around with that. And I've been working on figure drawing. That's uh, I think that's something we can always brush up on and be better with. I have a, a little art tribe to do weekly art making sessions and until quarantine hit we were doing figure drawing sessions weekly that I kind of stopped. Well, we're kind of getting together and we're we're getting together and just making art and, and we're all kind of sharing different things like one week we might be weaving one week we're drawing and the next week we're painting and so I'm curious about a lot of things and I want to learn a lot more things you know and just keep acquiring skills and knowledge you know yeah that's great and really just fun question what is your go-to order at your favorite restaurant? Fish tacos and salsa. Mm. It's funny how often that is the answer. What goes on fish tacos? We have some amazing ones at this restaurant that, I, that we frequent. And oh my gosh, that is just, my husband will call and say, hey, I'm going to be by, you know, the place. Can I get some fish tacos for you? And I'm like, oh, of course, always, you know. Yeah, love them. (laughs) So good. Yes, and I'm in LA, the you know center of Uh, tacos. Yes, for sure. (laughs) Got to come visit. I was in uh, San Diego last year for an AP art conference, and my husband went up to LA. He was out with me, and so yeah, he ate some he ate some great tacos while we were in San Diego. It was it was fantastic. So yeah, yeah. And I would love to Mm. love to come to LA at some point. I have to look you up when I get there. So yes, do absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And is there anybody that you would want to thank or give a shout out to? Yes. Gosh, there's so many. Definitely my husband and my son who have put up with all the crazy over all the years, like say early morning mm-hmm. setups and a lot of funding for themselves. I'm working on paintings and they're, they're great at that. 
and my mom and dad have always been my biggest supporters and still are mm-hmm. just my cheerleaders. And I have have a great school system, or the Allen Community School System that I work for. From the top down, my principal Chris Duncan, Vice Principal Diana Penny, and then my visual arts teachers that work with me, Carol McTyre and Leanne Wilson. My art tribe, the girls that I will regularly, Dana Harris, Glenda Brown, my students, and then last but not least, the Tennessee Arts Education Association in our area. Is, it's an amazing group and such a great bunch of people that I get to work with that association. Awesome. And last thing, where can listeners connect with you online? Oh, okay. So I have a website. It is melanieanderson.net. And I have got an Instagram account that would be Melanie T. Anderson. And then Facebook, Melanie Trout Anderson, Trout Like a Fish. But there's more art on my Instagram account than on my Facebook. There's personal pictures and things on Facebook. So Instagram, if you want to see art. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Melanie. Thank you. This was fun. I was so nervous. But uh, you, you made this very easy. So oh, good. thank you so much. Yeah. It was great to hear about your art and your teaching and everything. Thank you. Yeah. It was great. Melanie shared so much encouraging advice and experience. It felt so hopeful and helpful to hear her perspective as a parent. I definitely need that reminder to soak up this time with my daughter and give myself some grace with all the other things. This life is a marathon, not a sprint. There will be time when I won't be juggling quite so much, and maybe now I need to set a few things down momentarily. Do you feel that way? Melanie also talked about the book she has been working on, which sounds so exciting, Keep an eye out for her book and check out the blog post for this episode for a short video about the student project Melanie talked about, which looks at stereotypes. Thank you so much for listening. As always, you can reach me at Teaching Artist Podcast on Instagram or Teaching Artist Podcast at gmail.com. Who do you want to hear from? Please share your recommendations of teaching artists. And if you loved this episode, please subscribe, leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts, and follow me. It really makes a big difference. Thank you. Thank you.